Welcome to another GM Tips. Rick M. the GM here, and I hope you're doing good. I'm feeling pretty good. Got a little shine down on in the background, so if you hear a little bit of music, that's what it is. Kind of gets me in the mood. Um, one thing I'd say for all people who do ro play role-playing games, music is a great creative tool. It really is. Now, I know some people get distracted by it, and some people will get thrown off by it. So if it bothers you, then don't utilize it. But however, if you're not bothered by music, having it on low in the background is sometimes a good thing. So this week, we're going to look at, or this episode, we're going to look at designing plots and having multiple plots for your campaign. Again, a lot of the adventure paths that you buy already have these written into them. So if you're buying things like Rime of the Frostmaiden, um, Adventures Inc., um, or what was it? It's not Adventures Inc., but, uh, oh God, it's Corporations Inc. or something like that. Or if you get um, the Vicente and Avernus, if you get uh, the Mad Mage, or if you get um, what the heist, Waterdeep Heist, Dragon Heist one, uh, there's a lot of adventures that already will have multiple plots put into them. However, players do buy books. They do read these things. So I am just saying for you, even as a brand new dungeon master and game master, please understand that people know our tricks of the, of the world. And so sometimes they'll read ahead and sometimes they will, it'll be a good thing for us. Sometimes it'll be a bad thing. So that said, what are sources that we can use to come up with plots? And this, this goes into the brainstorming stage of your campaign. And, and in coming up with multiple plots, I don't think it's a bad thing. Because what happens if the players understand your plot from the beginning, go for the juggler, and then all of a sudden by fourth or fifth level, there's no more plot. This is where having multiple ideas to draw from com comes into play. All right, so in the DM's guide, and I'm pulling this up on D&D Beyond, as you may see, there is a whole section on um, adventure and creating a campaign. So you want to click on Create a Campaign. You can say creating a campaign kind of goes through, gives you a little bit of tips and where to locate it and all the other things. But here are the campaign events, and I call these the plot events, because really these are the things that are going to spin a plot or multiple plots from. It is a great guide for it. Now, that said, it is not the only guide for it. It is a guide that if you already have this or have it in your toolkit, becomes very handy. I always hear a lot of dungeon masters and game masters say, oh my God, I have nothing I can design a plot from, or man, same rehash plot. Going to something like this will help you. Uh, it's something I liked about Paizo Press's, our, um, Paizo Press's Game Master Guides for 2E and for 1E, and also for D&D 5E, as they give you a great section on this. So let's go down here and let's take a look at this. They have a world-shaking event. Now, normally a plot will have some sort of event that literally can shake the world itself. So these things can be pretty profound and give you an overall arc plot for a campaign. So the rise of a leader in an area, that's interesting sometimes. Sometimes it's a new area or an area that's had a weak leader and a new re leader rises in the region. They don't have to be a good leader. They can be a draconic kind of, or draconian, not draconic, draconian type of leader that literally is lawful evil and marches to the tune of law and is going to instill martial law on an area. Or it could be a leader that wants to create chaos and freedom and totally free an area and drive it to where anarchy rules and they rule amidst the anarchy. Or it could be somebody who's masochistic or um, sadistic and who enjoys the punishment of things coming down on top of them. There's a lot of ways you can take the rise of a leader, but it defines a whole era in the history of this world. 
So keep that in mind when you come up with this event, or a fall of a leader in an area. Sometimes the fall of a leader has a bigger splash than the rise of one. It leaves a vacuum, a vacuum that often can be pursued by multiple factions and can lead to a lot of political events occurring, which can be fun for role play, or it could lead to literal militant events occurring. Or in some cases, anarchy taking hold and a whole area burning to the ground of civilization. So those are two types of events that are profound world-shaking events. A cataclysmic disaster. Now, I, I like this idea, but I warn on this because this can take a lot out of your players and it has a deadline to it. It has a time clock ticking. And if they don't like the idea and they don't really care about the world, you're setting yourself up for disaster yourself, a cataclysmic disaster as a DM. So really explore this one lightly. It's an overused idea, and I like it because, again, event shifting cataclysms can have a profound effect. Now, a cataclysmic disaster doesn't have to mean the end of a world. It could be the end of a city or the end of a couple cities in an area. Icewind Dale, Rime of the Frost Maiden, is a good example of that. Or in Paizo Press's um, Reign of Winter, that's another one. Where winter is literally being forced upon the world to turn it into a world of winter. It starts in one area and jumps around a little bit. So again, the cataclysm is still catastrophic if it goes out of control but it's not as profoundly um, time clock sensitive. Events are occurring, but there's still plenty of time for characters to explore, do different other plots, find out about an area, and yet not be so driven that this cataclysmic event is going to end everything. And I'm sorry for my pronunciation today. I'm having fun with that. All right, so let's look at another one. An assault or invasion. Again, another time clock event, so you have to be careful unless you st step it a little bit. And, and here's where you can really think outside the box. It doesn't have to be a full-on invasion. Maybe there's a probing force that comes in that starts the events rolling a bit. And there's a larger timetable for that villain or hero or anti-hero's armies coming in and really doing the change and the war that they're intending upon. So, again, I, I, I'm not saying don't do timetable events, but you got to have the right player mix for it in order to do those. A rebellion, a revolution, or an overthrow. Again, another huge event, but it doesn't have to be all-encompassing. Like, for instance, there was one um, in Pathfinder uh, where the the songbird one adventure path was the overthrow of an infernal government by a more benevolent and good and chaotic group that wanted more creativity and more independence for their region so again doesn't have to be totally profound or timetable wise a timetable event it could be the very beginnings of this and your players are caught up in it and have to figure out what's going on. Do they join the rebellion? Do they join the revolution? Do they help the current government? What is the answer? And so there's a lot to be done there. But again, really think that out and allow a lot of side branches and exploration. Otherwise, you almost railroad them into a set of events. Extinction or depletion? I don't like extinction. I think it is way too intense but again, it's up to you as a DM. I think it puts too much on the shoulders of the players. Now, a depletion, that's different. So maybe resources are going down or mismanaged resources are going down or consortiums are coming in and, and just demolishing an area's resources. That's something that can be interesting and fun with a lot of plot twists. So it allows a lot of freedom for your players and it's not a bad idea. Again, I'm not an extinction guy because I think there's just, again, way too much pressure. New organization. A new organization comes into town. What do we mean by that? Well, 
let's look at the Zentarum, the Red River Wizards of Thay. There are different groups that can come in. Maybe in, on Eberron, it's one of the families, a guild, that is coming together and coming to a rising point. And because of it, there's going to be an imminent changes going on and disruption. That's an interesting plot. A lot more role play, a lot more fun events, a lot of paths and avenues you can take, but it's a good thing. Discovery, expansion, or invention. I always love those because that leads to the players going out and finding new things, discovering new things. Maybe it's gunpowder. Maybe it's a uh, certain navigational device. Maybe it's finding old knowledge that can be then incorporated in the new times with what's known to help this age be a more enlightened age or a more disruptive age. Again, interesting stuff, a lot of different directions you can go. And there's a lot of fun to it. Predictions, omens, and prophecies. Oh, I love these. Now, again, they can get overused and pretty tropey after a while. But a prediction, an omen, a prophecy. That can take players down different directions as they're discovering what is the true meaning of this omen, this portent, this prophecy, this prediction. Is it literal? Is it figurative? Is it both? There's a lot you can do with that, and there's a lot of directions you can take that. There isn't just one path with that. There are so many different ties in with that. A myth or a legend. So say a myth or a legend appears, something that has been brought up. Maybe it is the Thin Man. Maybe it's something about the Fae, since we're going towards Fae type of campaigns. This is pretty interesting. Now, here's the predictions, omens, and prophecies. And there's the myth and legend a little bit. Now, myth and legend. If wars, plagues, discoveries, and the like can be called world-shaking, mythic events exceed and surpass them. A mythic event might occur as a fulfillment of an ancient or long-forgotten prophecy. And it might act, be an act of divine intervention. Again, you kind of go up and make it one of the others that you can choose off that list but make it as a myth mythological or legendary event they consider like a cataclysmic disaster a world around deluge kind of like the bible used to talk about again i'm not saying to do it but that that's a perfect thing of the event of the flood that would be something that falls in that an ice age uh, meteor impacting things and sending the world into an ice age or into an age of deserts again it's a lot it could be too much for your players this creating a prophecy i like this because there's a lot you can do and there's a lot of great questions to ask okay so next that comes with that what are some other sources so we're going to look at some sources and great areas of knowledge for creating paths okay so where i'm going to go to is the pirate campaign compendium all these books tend to have some plots sections that are really good to them. And let me go down here because these are water-based campaign plots. So again, depending on what you want to do, there's some great ideas within these books. Sorry, I'm kind of going down past the things. There's the table of contents. Um, pirates and plunder. Aquatic adventuring. So... Let's look up here, because we don't get into battle fleets yet. We want to go really about 114, so bear with me as I go to page 114 in here. Type it in, 115, because it's always a page or two off. Okay, aquatic adventuring. So, again, they have a lot of rules and drowning, things like that. Where do you want to set the campaign? So that's always the first thing about a campaign. I love nautical campaigns because there's so many environments you can do with them. Shipwrecks, reefs, dunes, tidal pools. There are places that you can set up a campaign. Maybe it's on a set of islands. Um, so, let's take a look a little bit at this and see if we go down a little further and if they tell it. I thought I, we had something in there. All right, let me see. Hang on. I know, right? I should have all this stuff set out, but... Okay, so I'm just going to discuss this a little bit without this. I'm going to keep this up. 
so what are some nautical campaigns? Well, maybe your ship is a, an exploration ship that's going to explore new worlds and new um, coasts. You don't have to make it Christopher Columbus, where it's a catastrophic event to some other civilization. Literally, your group could be coming just to see what else is out there in the world or what hasn't been explored or not hasn't been explored in quite a long time. Maybe it's to reestablish diplomatic relations. Maybe it's to take up um, and offer a partnership or alliance with another nation. Shipboard campaigns can be fun. can be a pirate campaign. Again, used a lot. It's a trope. But there's different type of pirate twists. They can be corsairs that go after other pirates and try to stop really evil pirates from destroying and disrupting shipping lanes and lines. Maybe it's recovering a lost artifact under the ocean. Maybe it's establishing a relationship with an underwater civilization and trying to build that relationship with them. Maybe it is actually attacking an enemy nation's supply lines and literally sinking their ships and trying to devastate what they're doing. Maybe they're an evil nation that is trying to do something, or maybe they're a good one that's trying to reestablish a hold in a region, and you want to disrupt this. Um, maybe it's ascending to a pirate captaincy over a whole fleet or region. So your characters are literally becoming that flagship for the fleet and trying to gain that, that uh, alpha position in that fleet. Or maybe it is trying to prevent another nation from being invaded. There's a lot you can do on the ocean. There's a lot of places you can go with it. You could be going to lost lands that have long been overgrown and fallen where the knowledge has been lost. And you're going into that area to find out more about it. So that's another thought that you can use. So, again, waterborne campaigns are something. And again, it's a little bit different than just the standard ones. I mean, you can use those standard creation rules for plots. But the problem with that is that sometimes they don't well cover a, an environment. I like the desert campaign. So maybe you're finding ruins and artifacts for a government that have been long lost in the burial tombs of the ancients. Again, you don't have to be a plunderer for these. You're just trying to restore them to the nation that you're a part of. So literally, you're trying to find antiquities to help the nation to rise in prominence again and to really become a place that people want to go to learn about these different ideas. So a different twist on like an Egypt campaign. There's a lot you can do with that. Desert caravans. Maybe it's establishing a supply route or trying to establish a new oasis if there's water shortages and find a new oasis that no one else has discovered. Maybe it is trying to stop an old and ominous curse that has come upon a land. There's a lot you can do when creating campaigns. So have lots of ideas and write these down as a brainstorming session. After that, you're going to fill these ideas out and flesh them out. And there's a lot of books you can use for that. Uh, the great thing is DMs Guild has a lot of great ideas and campaigns that you can draw upon that you can get material for, as does um, RPG, drive through RPG. I know I hit those two a lot, but you can find most people's books at those, and a lot of third-party books. So those help in the implement of a campaign. So as you're coming up with these ideas for it, maybe you flesh out and say, okay, at the early levels, I want to give them these options. They can go to city A, or they can go out there to tomb B, or they can go on a ship voyage just to get their feet under them and get used to what it is to be sailing upon the sea. Maybe it's a regatta where they're hiring on as part of the crew to test their metal and show that they're worthwhile for being part of a crew by going through this regatta and, and showing their aptitude in doing so. Maybe it literally is reaching out and making first contact to an underwater civilization or reestablishing contact. You can really build these ideas. So I would write out a chart that shows different skines of where people can go. All going to the main idea and filtering to the main idea and the main overshadowing plot. But lots of feeds into it. 
That way it gives the players a lot of variety and tests. I always love having guild missions and quests because for a party, then they can pick and choose, kind of like an adventurer's guild, off the board. Where do they want to go and which one do they want to work on now? Those are a lot of fun. Now, it's going to take a little bit of design work for you. But again, these are type of ideas for campaigns that you can use. All right. Now, I'm going to go over to Paizo stuff. Why? Because just because it's for Pathfinder, it doesn't mean it can't be used for other RPGs. And so realize that sometimes you can get other sources from other titles and games, and you can use them for plots. That's the great part about the materials. And owning different ones doesn't hurt. Because again, Game Mastery Guide in this book has very little difference from the D&D books in the sense that you can use either interchangeably. Now, there are mechanics that you may or may not be able to use interchangeably, and that you got to look at. But, okay, so campaign structure and adventure design. I love that. 36 to 40. So let's go take a look and see if there are some differences, maybe, in what Paizo has written, or Paizo has written on these things. So, again... I like it. Adventure structures. Do you want to do a one-shot, a brief campaign, an extended campaign, an epic campaign? Beautiful thoughts and ideas. And that is something, remember we, we had the last video talking about designing your campaign in, in an overall campaign. That's something I love about it, is they give you those ideas. So let's look at starting and ending a campaign in adventure design. Because again, Look at what we got here. You notice this on page 40, styles. The overall vibe of your game, such as a gritty game, a dungeon crawl, a high adventure. Again, goes into the, the idea. Threats, these are plot ideas. And motivations and story arcs. They have them 43 and 44. So let's take a look a little bit on this. All right, so I love this because they lay out how long these will last. So a dungeon crawl. Could be three to four sessions long. Maybe six to eight but it tells you how many sessions normally these encompass a really gritty adventure could be five to seven ones and it gives you examples of these things of what you can design like two trivial combat encounters four low encounters seven moderate those are all things you can use in DD you can convert the challenges so i love that they give you these kind of design ideas when you don't necessarily have it Let's look at high adventure. High adventure can be six to eight sessions. Horror can be one to two. Intrigue can be two to three. So they give you some ideas. A military adventure, a mystery, a planner adventure, a romantic adventure. What great ideas. And they're leading into telling you a little bit about what you need to know. Now, let's look here for a second. Story arcs. All right. So. I like some of the tips here. Again, they're not giving us new things like the DM's guide of, of overall things, but here's some good points. Use motifs. Use repeated thematic elements, visuals, and phrases and items to reinforce the connection between one adventure and the other part of the story. Yes, tie things together. And you'll hear me say that all the time. It could be twisty and turny. But always tie them together because it is so important on that. Now let's look down. Follow character growth. Respond to how the PCs change in the previous adventures. Yes, finally a book saying it. I love that because it is the character's story. And you'll hear me say that time and again. So in your actual campaign, follow the growths of your different characters. Keep a journal on them. See where they've already had pinnacle events. Let them reprise it. Let them write down the information for you. And, and really reprise what they gained from those last adventures. So you have a step along path of how they progressed. Escalate. Build on the previous story and show that the next threat is even scarier. Now... Again, use this with care. You don't always have to escalate. You can. You can make the next one build upon it that it's much more urgent, or the creature is more powerful, or the, the, the hidden bad guy or good guy is more powerful. Escalation does work, but don't beat it 
to death, okay? Sparingly. Bring in recurring characters. Remember what I said about the recurring NPCs? This is a key thematic on it. And I love that they touched on this. Now you see where I get a lot of my ideas on these things. Not just from great people on the internet, but sources like this. Make each adventure count. Have a build-up. In other words, you start the adventure with a recap. Let your players recap it for you. Then go into where you left off and build to events within it. And I say this, probably five out of every six sessions, leave it with a cliffhanger. Now, you don't have to do that all the time. It wears people out. But at least enough that they're hanging on the edge of their seats on where to go. And that previous adventure took you to a build-up where you're hanging them until the next time. And that's important. So keep that in mind. Now, uh, they got encounter design in here and everything else. So that's another thing. Now, enemy motivations, that's part of the plot. Why is this enemy of theirs doing what they are doing? That is so important. Why are they working with the pirates? Why are they working with the good church, even though they're an evil organization? Tying these points together makes a very fluid story. And again, try not to make it obvious. Let them assume they have it figured out. But you got a couple twists thrown in there that keeps them from truly having it figured out. Now, I'm going to go to Kobold Press because they've got a great one. So as you can see, i got lots of stuff. There's a reason why. All right, so Kobold Guide to Game Masterings. Ooh. Plots and campaigns. There's my one. That's what I was looking for. There are sources. Look, Kobold Press, Guide to D Designing Plots and Campaigns. And these have a lot of great people like Wolfgang Bauer, Zeb Cook, James Jacobs, um, Ben McFarland, Amber Scott. Amber does some great stuff. Uh, Margaret Weiss, um, and then Ree Sosby. There are some real great names here that are included in. But what I love is they go through, and let me just kind of blow up so you can see the words a little bit. They go through really what it takes to building plots and campaigns. This is a book worth owning. I'm just going to tell you that right now. It is absolutely worth it. And each chapter has something to talk about. So, again, beginning campaigns, other people's stories, your NPCs and player characters. Choose an ending first. Take a walk on the dark side, so maybe a more darker-based adventure. Otherworldly visions, maybe planner things or Cthulhu-esque things. Steve Winter does a great job on that. When we last left our intrepid heroes, remember I said cliffhangers. This goes into that in that, cha in that chapter and talks about it. Tricks of oral tradition. How do you build up a great oral tradition that people can repeat and continue to repeat about the campaign? Action scenes. More than just flying blades. Thank you, Margaret Weiss. I loved reading this chapter. What she shared was immensely helpful. I will just say this. Because it isn't about just flashing blades and action all the time. There's other types of action. Tone and bombast. Um, what is the tone of that session? What is the tone of that situation? Branching storylines and non-linear gameplay. Remember I told you about this? The spider web? That comes from Ree Sosby. That is something I credit back to Ree because Ree taught me that. Is that everything doesn't have to go linear from A to B to C to D. Read this. Please, young game masters, read this. Because that 62 to 68 pages six pages is so much worth it it teaches you some great elements of non-linear stories okay crooked characters characters that maybe aren't the hero they're the anti-hero it's a great guide on talking how to run them and everything else fashioning the enemy not just creating them but creating a look for them great stuff pacing beats and passage of time i love that wolfgang did a great job on that chapter really taking you through and seeing how to pace a game for different elements 
complex plotting. If you want to get really deep into the plots and into the stories, this is a great chapter. Sharpening your hooks, your tools. Know how to use your tools as a DM. The art of letting go. Let the players tell the story. And Zeb Cook does such a tremendous job of teaching that and that. And you've heard it from other DMs, I guarantee you. Uh, Abria, um, Matt Mercer, uh, B. Dave Walters. They all talk it. Um, oh gosh, our bronze girl, the bronze girl. Um, Satine Phoenix. All of these teach this type of of work with it. Um, Joe Manganello. Take a listen to them. They really do have the right thing on saying the players write the story. Abria has really been, and again, I'm sorry, I've mispronounced your name a couple times, Abria. I, mm, I get going into something and I just don't let my brain engage. I've watched EXU and literally she, even though she has some influence and want to take them certain ways, she literally lets them write the story. And that's the epic part of it, is letting them do that. Plotting a general cam generational campaign, so maybe multi-generations. So they start with one set of characters, and then they go to their characters' kids, or the next generation, or the generation after that. You can do a campaign like that and keep it ongoing, but change the stories, change the locations, take them different places. They're still in that campaign, but they're going to new, fresh places. Great idea. Using cliffhangers effectively. Thank you, Amber Scott. You taught me a lot on that. I love cliffhangers. And an improv adventure, a journey from here to there. That's how, if you don't have anything prepared, you can improv it. Please, this book, at different times, is such a great read. It is probably about 30 bucks, 35 maybe 40 for the PDF. Buy it. I'm not kidding. I'm not doing this to, to just support great writers. That's not the reason. This is a tool in my toolkit that I go back to again and again to sharpen myself. If you don't do this and get yourself this, then you are truly missing out. Now, there's a sister book to it, okay? And this is the one I almost went, The Guide to Game Mastering. You have never game mastered before, right? Look at who that looks like on the cover. Not saying it's him, but it sure looks like him, doesn't it? Matthew Mercer. <laughs> so again great writer shanna germain a tremendous tremendous creator along with monica valentine valentinelli there are some great people in here now why is it worth it here we go these go into how to be a better game master so creating a fun inclusive game Remember, that's the topic of today. Make your game inclusive. Make players shine, not you, miss or mister, or them, GM or DM, if you want to go by uh, non-binary terminology. And I do respect that, by the way. GMing for kids. GMing initiative. Engaging shy players to want to play in your games. People at the table, advice for new GMs. Please read this. <laughs> it's such a great help for all of you. Um, you know, planning your campaign into four stages. So four different plot hooks that take it to different levels. See, I do listen on these things, Monica. I really do. I do read these things and listen. Game Mastering on the Fly. For those moments, thank you, Brandon Hodge, for that, because we all need that. Um, character love interests. Oh, James Jacobs, I have listened to that, and believe me, I've had now three campaigns where there have been love interests that have worked out really well and have been in to where all the players are cheering them on. Winning player investment, you got to win them to invest into your game and your campaign. And then the game and play, all these different things. I love these. But take a look at some of these. And it goes on. And then in between sessions and moving the perspective. Two tremendous tools from Cobell Press that you will never regret putting into your toolbox. 
you need to have toolbox items. I've given you now four great books on that. There are more out there. But these four, I can tell you and attest to that I have literally put them into implementation. And it's why my games are where they are right now. Now, I still need to learn more. I am not doing enough, and I can tell you that. But it's okay. I've grown leaps and bounds because of it. So keep in mind, you can see how big my, my book things are. Now, I will say this. You're not going to build this in a year. And you're not going to build it in a day. Don't go broke trying to do it all at once. Game Masters and DMs right now. Go out, save up the money for Game Master, Guide to Game Mastering and Plots and Campaigns. And then add those to your reading list. And then try to put them in play each session. And then ask your players, how was the session? Did you guys feel that there was something different? I guarantee you they'll tell you. And they'll give you laud and praise for it because you have gone out there and advanced your actual um, library. All right, so we're getting about 37 minutes. I don't want to really go above like 38, but I do want to round it down with saying this don't be afraid to have different guides. Get them in, whether it's a D&D Beyond, whether it is something like this from Kobo Press, whether it's articles that you get out on the internet. Make sure, number one, that they're recommended by some pretty good GMs that you know, because that's important. There's some garbage out there, too, and no offense to the writers of it, but some of it can be very antiquated and not the here and now. Sharpen your toolkit. Come up with some great things for these players because they need that they need a dm and gm that is evolving and growing you can do this i've heard so many people say i don't know if i can do this these are the tools i'm giving you the things i didn't get told to me initially to help you i'm here for you as are many other DMs and GMs. We want you to succeed. I want to see hundreds of more dungeon masters, game masters that are growing, that are great at their craft. Why? Because then that gives me a break to play. And it lets others have a break to play. And yet we still sharpen our toolkit by sitting in your sessions and learning from you. Yes, you. You're going to teach each of us, each of us old hands at this, new things. Don't think you don't. You definitely do. And so have a great week. Mull on this a little bit. Take these gems and run with them and create amazing plots and campaigns. Thank you for your time. This is Rick M. the GM signing out. Have an amazing week.